Welcome back and thanks for staying tuned. Of course, it's the Rise and Shine this Wednesday morning. And we're beaming live from Uyo. Take advantage of all the social media platforms, all of which you can find at SpectrumTVLive.ng to engage on the conversation and also give us feedback on what you would love for us to do for you as a station. At this point, we have a guest joining us, Dr. Wisdom Enang, who is an energy expert. Of course, he also has had quality time in the field of oil and gas and we'll be throwing some questions towards him this morning just in a bid to get answers as to what exactly is happening in the crude oil market in nigeria the conversations are a bit of a twist so we're hoping to get some direction good morning um dr wisdom and I'm good to have you on rise and shine this morning good morning Uyai. thank you very much for having me thank you i also have ime emmanuel here on set good morning doctor good to have Hi, you on good morning Emmanuel. thank you very much right. thank you so much so doctor it, it looks like in the last couple of weeks we've had a myriad of conversations around crude oil i will just summarize it in a, a layman's term before we begin to break down the specifics now we are talking about the fact that you know our nnpc is looking to move our um, barrels per day production to about 1.6 million um, as it stands. And also there's a conversation of do we want to sell crude to um, the Dangote refinery. Now remember that at the beginning um, there seemed to have been an agreement between the federal government, the NNPC mm -hmm. and that refinery uh, for us to sell crude to them. But it looks like there's been some discrepancies along the way. Just in line with that also, we began to see the narrative of selling crude to the Dangote refinery in Naira. I told that he would sell it back to us in Naira. There's also been the narrative of um, him buying crude from outside the country, now from international um, sellers. That is causing quite a concern on the landscape of um, oil and gas conversation in the country. Holistically, these are the conversations we want to break down on this morning, Doctor. All right, thank you. Well, I'm ready. All right, so let's, um, let, let's go to um, availability of crude in the country and, you know, us trying to increase the barrels per day production. What, what's been the factors that have mitigated against this in time? Because there's been ex excuses that we are all familiar with, but what is making the NNPC feel they're ready to up their game? All right, so if you look at the crude profile, uh, let's just take crude production predominantly. Uh, if you look at the crude uh, production profile, there are a number of things that would affect our ability to bring in new, uh, you know, to increase our volumes. Uh, the first one I'd like to say is accountability, because at the moment, the crude metering are actually done by the companies and the reports to the government. What that means is you could potentially have a company, if they're not ethical, uh, report uh, much lesser than they actually produce. So some people are saying that Nigeria does produce up to 1.7, 1.8 at the moment, but are reporting way less because we rely on the uh, companies that are producing to report their own production. That's on one part. That's on the path of accountability and transparency of the production itself. The second thing is about crude theft. We lose a lot, and we lose it, uh, you know, potentially because people do not want to invest in those areas. And we also lose them in real sense because the uh, criminals are tapping from those pipelines and actively taking out the volumes that should actually be going into our production uh, count. Then, of course, we then have the fact that we have uh, facilities that we are not maximizing their production capacity. So when you start producing an asset, it is driven based on reservoir pressure. And, but as you get to a certain point, the reservoir pressure will deplete over time. Uh, and that means at some point you will need to have some primary, uh, sorry, uh, sort of enhancements for production for you to get uh, you know, more volumes out. But most of our facilities are not currently uh, you know, being engineered to produce in that way. So we actually lose the potential to bring in more volumes. The third one is, the, the fourth one is um, the 
with the enactment of the PIA, the Petroleum Industry Act, we were to set aside, I think, about 3% of our operating costs for the exploration of new frontiers. It might interest you to know, we are that a number of the uh, assets that we are at the moment producing were, you know, explored in the 1960s. What does that mean? It means that we haven't even made a concerted effort to see with the hindsight of new technology, with the hindsight of improved, uh, you know, uh, well exploration techniques, if we can actually add more volumes to our proven volumes. So I think these are the things. Now, if you ask me, of all this broad spectrum of ideas, which of them is the NMPC going forward to say, we're going to add more, increase our volumes? NMPC is going on the side of reliability. The reliability is improving the assets to produce more. NMPC is going on the side of uh, leveraging the effect of the joint tax force on, uh, on being, uh, tackling crude theft to say, okay, if we tackle crude theft, we can bring these assets back to life, we can start producing these assets, and we can actually stop the loss of this inventory, and so we're able to get our production to 1.7 million barrels. So it's, in a nutshell, tackling some of those things that I have said in the broad spectrum of the factors that affect our oil production volume. Now, Dr. Dr. Ina, you know, over time we've heard NNC say that um, most of the reason why they do not produce to a certain, you know, amount of volume is due to oil theft, which you've also, you know, affirmed to. Now, the question is, one would have thought that privatizing NNPC would have brought an end or probably reduced the level of oil theft in the industry. What are the modalities that, that can be in place to reduce the level of oil theft in, in, in the oil sector? All right. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm going to tell you from a systematic standpoint what we can do. And I'm also going to tell you exactly what from, from uh, you know, sort of uh, from, from the, the way we work our regulatory framework, what we need to change. Now, let's look at all thefts. Uh, you know, the, if I were to solve all thefts, I would deploy what I call a PDRR a predict, detect, respond, and recover. Now, what is, the predict, uh, what is prediction? Prediction is finding out how the, um, you know, to, to make sure that you can spot when there's an oil theft or potential oil theft. So what does that mean? Potential oil theft means you have breached the fence or the barricade or the area that has been mapped out for people uh, to, to go through, whether it's fishermen, or it's uh, passerbys, you're not to encroach in that area. And so there are sensors there that tell, well, somebody is coming within about, uh, say, maybe 30 meters of the pipeline. That is one prediction uh, aspect. Uh, prediction also means that within the pipeline itself, that we're constantly monitoring pressure, we're constantly monitoring the, vo uh, the, the flow rate, and then we are able to, uh, you know, interpolate these factors and tell where there's a drop in pressure. And that will tell us if there's a leakage or someone has tampered with the pipeline. That is one aspect. When you talk about a detect, you're talking about how you take this information and wire it into your console, mine that data, and you're able to make informed decisions. So you know, okay, there's a pressure drop and a flow rate drop. Is it as a result of my production has come down? Or is it as a result of the fact that someone, the production is still up, but someone has tempered with the pipeline? Or is it as a result of there's a pipeline, there's a real accident on the pipeline? Those are, you know, stuff that you do when you mine that data and begin to detect your trends. Your response and recover is very important because what it does is that it sends a signal to the people who are supposed to be the human intervention. These people uh, are meant to look at these signals and, re and, and respond. For example, if there's a potential breach in the oil, uh, you know, the oil pipeline, and it's showing that there's a potential or there's an active theft going on, then we should have a joint task force. And when we're putting the joint task force in place, there's, there's always something I call uh, you know, the uh, color band grading of the different safety aspects. Now, if your pipeline is running through an 80 kilometer uh, path, way, what you, you typically want to do is to make sure that on that path, you map out 
your, your area based on your green, your amber, and your red. And that indicates the risk rating. Because if, for example, the pipeline is crisscrossing through a creek where there's a lot of people and there's a potential for bunkering, that would typically class as a red. If it is going through an area where there's really nothing going on, it's an arid land, you can say that is a green. Now, what does that mean? The green, the, red, the amber, and the red will help you to distribute your tax force for your response and recover. Because if you know that that area where your pipeline is going through has a potential for violence, has a potential for people to bunker your pipeline, you would like to put more human beings there because you know there's a higher tendency of your response and recover becoming active. And so, what it means is when it comes to the respond and recover, we need to be strategic in laying out the personnel. But then there's another problem. The problem you would ask me is, even after you have deployed your equipment barriers, even after you have deployed your process barriers against bunkery, what happens if the human barrier is compromised? And that's true. That is very true. That you cannot talk about this without looking at the fact that the human factor could potentially be compromised. But one of the ways to solve that compromise is to make sure that people, if people have the causes to take different actions, that there are consequences at the end of that action. So causes, actions, and consequences. If our legal system is not able to punish people, if the system itself, the enforcement system is not able to name and shame, there will always be the incentive for people to compromise the equipment and the process barriers, which in effect should have come together with the people barriers to give us a long lasting and sustainable solution to the oil theft issue. Okay, hmm. so Doctor, you've enumerated very you know, laudable systems that can be put in place to mitigate oil theft in Nigeria. If you, who is an expert in the industry, living in Nigeria, knows these things, I can imagine that there's more of you within the industry that are privy to this body of information. Why then haven't we seen the implementation of these kinds of ideas to mitigate all theft in the country, which will, in the overall, um, improve our oil production quota? All right. I mean, look, I'm going to start by... Uh, you know, reflecting a quote that I learned from the, I think it was the Webster's Dictionary that says that common sense is really common. Uh, and that is also uh, further, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, worsened by the fact that the people that have the ideas are not in the corridor of power, and the, but the people that are going to share the common wealth and don't even know how to grow in the corridor of power. That's the first way I'll start. The second way I'll start is, i tell you what, you know, it, it takes... Um, a lot for you to have that sense of common purpose and drive above the sense of trying to exploit a potential avenue for conflict of interest to make money. So when you talk about do they know these ideas, of course they should know it. But, and they should know it better because I have an experience, uh, you know, being in this field to have an, a real life experience of, of all theft. But they have had a lot of data points. By the time you're hearing that there are more than 100, an average of 100 tappings on one pipeline, they know the modalities. And look, let me tell you what, they know even who is doing these things because these guys live in the community without the name and shame and without the implementation in an integrated manner that takes advantage of all of these other protocols, the equipment, the uh, process, and the human, we're not going anywhere. But the question is, do we have the political will to step on toes and do the right thing? Yeah. Not everybody has that sort of ability. Mm. And, and the truth is, we would be better for it if our leaders, or even a few, should even attempt to, to imbibe this kind of uh, discipline. Okay. Mm. Uh Really serious. So let, let's push the conversation further a little bit, um, Doctor, this morning. We see um, the fact that in just a couple of days back, um, the, the federal government, as led um, by the Federal Executive Council, directed the Nigerian National um, Petroleum Company Limited to actually consider um, selling crude oil to Nigerian refineries in Naira. Now, that's a conversation we really need to look into 
the pros and cons of actually um, taking this particular uh, step. A lot of people have already lauded it as a game changer if it is effected. All right. Um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is uh, it should be a good idea, but there are some condi conditionality to that happening. And I'm going to express it now. We, are, we need to have a homogeneous mix of our uh, the signals that we send out. Okay, how do you justify that uh, directive from the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the fact that actively the NMPC are looking for $2 billion uh, crude-backed loans for them to get, right? Mm. And vis-a-vis -vis the fact that we have a lot of uh, we have 55% of our production quota already earmarked in crude backed loans, forward sales that have been, uh, you know, backed by reserve, crude reserves. Okay. Now, the problem is um, if we sell in Naira, do we have enough to be able to make a difference in terms of volume that we will be able to give to the domestic, uh, you know, to the domestic um, uh, refiners? Do we have enough volume for them? to mm. make a difference. Now, the second problem that we're having, it's a challenge. I'm not going to say problem, so, so to say, because it's areas that we need to look at. The second challenge that we have is the fact that when you put in your, uh, you know, you, you have, yes, you have a quota that you, you, you perhaps, you know, you want to sell to the domestic market. Mm -hmm. The next question is, um, do we, have we been able to mop out the excess liquidity in the Naira market, because I'm going to tell you something. Even if you sell in Naira, but there's so much liquidity of Naira, whatever you're trying to salvage is just a little fraction of the excess liquidity and will not make any difference to the prospect of the Naira. So we need to ask ourselves, and this is part of the monetary policies, do we still have the excess liquidity? How much do we have, or do we have enough liquidity that we can say we're good, we can start boosting uh, the, you know, the consumption of Naira itself, and it will make a difference. So these are the, 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 the things that we need to look out for to make it a success. So if you're asking, is it, a, is it something that is good? It's potentially good if only we have the imperatives that are in place. There are all positives about it. The other thing is this. Where is this Naira going to be sourced? Is it going to be sourced in the black market, or are you going to force them to come to the, uh, uh, you know, to come to um, the um, foreign exchange market and exchange? I'll give you context. If you say they should go and source it in the black market, of course we know that in the informal market, that where the transaction, a lot of transactions go on, that there, that more than sixty percent of Nigeria's transactions goes on in the informal market. So even if they source it in the informal market, it doesn't make a difference to the Nigerian economy from the perspective of improving our foreign exchange. But if you force them that, look, go to the foreign exchange market and buy Naira, that means they actually have to have dollar. That's the truth of the matter. They have to have dollar, go to that FX market, sell it there, buy Naira, get it into the account, and then come and buy our crude. But so ultimately, it's not like you're avoiding them, uh, you know, getting a, uh, in that method. It's not like you're avoiding them spending the dollar. It's just that they're not paying the dollar to you, but they're taking the dollar to go and exchange in the foreign exchange market to buy Naira. So we don't know which one it is. Are they going to officially buy, or are they just going to put a pile of uh, Naira in their bank account and go and buy it? These are the things that we inform whether it will even work in the first instance, uh, are talk less of whether it will be counterproductive or uh, productive. Now, now um, Dr. Enna, you know, looking at all this you've stated uh, here and um, the story surrounding all these issues, and um, a lot of things are put into consideration. It's going to be a whole lot of demand on an NNPC to produce more. If they are going to even be selling to Dangote Refining, there's going to be a whole lot for them. Now, the question is, I want to take you a little bit back. You talked about transparency 
over time, there's been a lot of question of transparency within the NNPCL and um, the level of the, the, the amount of volume of crude oil they're producing and exporting and all of it. Even the former Minister of Finance, in person of Ngozi Okunjo, really has said that even during our term as the Minister of Finance, there were issues, fingers pointing at NNPC for, you know, transparency issues. Now, I would like you to address that particular factor. In, because you had mentioned it that so, most of the time they, there's, there's under reportage of the number of you know, barrels per day they are producing. I want you to talk about transparency within the oil sector. All right, thank you very much. Um, you know, I had said that there is a potential for under reporting the moment you start asking uh, the companies to report their own uh, crude production. But talking on the issue of transparency, it's, it's always been an issue. Um, and it was even worse. Uh, I know you mentioned Nkozi Okonjiwala at the time, uh, you know, being the Minister for Finance. And that, under her tenure, it was even worse because recall what was the outcry for the creation, uh, for the enactment of the Petroleum Industry Act. It was partially because we had the NNPC as a then being a regulator and also being an oil industry player. So there is no way the NMPC would not have a potential for conflict of interest. There is no way if they're the ones that are, in a nutshell, regulating uh, companies and also playing in that field, there's no way they're not going to tilt the balance in their own favor. It's normal. So this transparency is a very big issue. Whether it comes to the reporting, it comes to contracting, it comes to everything, even the crude production itself. Even, I mean, look, as I said, the Petroleum Industry Act says that if you're exploring, an, uh, that, uh, the, sorry, for every 3% you make, of, of money you make, that you should put that back into exploration of front, new frontiers. But the reality is no one is doing it and no one is getting punished. If that mandate was to be to the local or international oil and gas companies, there would have been punitive action. But because it's to the NMPC, you haven't heard anybody being called out. You've also heard the NMPC, uh, the, you know, uh, GMD, under the Buhari administration, say that before the end of the administration, that the four refineries will be up. And now we are, you know, second year into the Tinubu led administration, the refineries are not up. Nobody has been sacked. So there's still a lot of transparency issues. And I think we haven't quite been able to unbundle ourselves or cut the umbilical cord between the era before the Petroleum Industry Act, where uh, we, we, we had, um, you know, uh, the NMPC becoming the regulator and the person that is uh, also playing in the field, and this era where the NMPC is supposed to operate like a private entity. There's still that inter, you know, interplay between the NMPC and the interventionist role that they're playing in Nigeria. And the thing is, there's a tendency that they get away with a lot of things, even when they're not keeping to, uh, you know, some of the some of the rules that should be on ground. So the transparency issue is still subsisting, but it was even worse before the PIA. Mm. Okay, so uh, th these are really serious concerns. It raises just more some more questions in our minds. Now we know that 450,000 um, barrels per day is what. Um, the um, FEC has actually set aside, you know, for as crude to domestic refiners in the country. Because earlier when we talked about the sale of the crude in Naira, you were asking the question of, do we even have enough to circulate among the refiners and the country? The designate that we have is 450,000. It's 450,000 barrels enough to go around the refiners that we have in the country. I think um, the $20 billion worth refinery in Lagos only takes... Um, way more than that but i mean it's a quota that will be will be you know shared to, across all of them but doctor my my concern now is in agreeing that selling crude oil out of this 450,000 barrels that is accrued for domestic refinery in agreeing that selling it in naira is going to be to the optimum benefit of you know the crude oil oil and gas space in nigeria what are some of the factors that you think would even stand against us seeing this coming to fruition because you know ipman and other agencies are already you know 
complaining. Now, there are statements that they have written to the NNPC already requesting to buy crude as the president had directed in the FEC meeting already. But as we sit this morning, that procedure has not started. And Nigerians are weary of hearing, let's do this, but it never gets done. What are some of the factors that you think will get in the way of these refiner, refiners getting oil in the Naira? Okay, so let's even start with some of the things that can make us, uh, you know, not even get any crude at all. Because we have to also think about the worst case scenario, not just the best case scenario. Now, um, we, we, we've been told that they are marking about 400 a thousand barrels or thereabouts. But what, one thing you need to know is uh, we have uh, the J. So for every production that we make, we have the joint venture agreement or the production sharing contracts that the, each of the partners will take their own share across those contracts. So we have a net value that is minus the amount that goes to the companies in these contracts. Now, once we get to that next position, we also have forward sales that take 55% of that particular production uh, net volume. Then we have 45% uh, left, and out of that 45%, we have to provide to the domestic market, and we also have to export because we still need the dollars in the first instance. Now, the truth is, we are, there's a very high potential that we may not also be able to give them up to 450,000 barrels. That is, or 400,000 barrels, that is an indicative value of the target. But that is not to say that heaven is going to fall if we cannot meet it. And I've told you scenarios that can make sure we do not meet, we, that can militate against us meeting that quota. Now, if you're talking about uh, what could potentially go wrong now, if you're asking for you to have the effect, right, sorry, uh, of, of the policy that you're trying to build, which is to improve the Naira and make availability of crude supply, you would need those companies to go and trade in the foreign exchange market. That means what, they will take whatever currency they have and sell that currency and uh, use Naira to, uh, and buy Naira and then use it. If you do not do that, there is a risk of those companies going to get their crude, uh, their, their Naira supply from the informal market, which will not even do anything at all to the foreign exchange. It will, in fact, it's going to be a waste of our time. We have better bought, sold in dollars and use it to intervene in our FX market. But, but, so now, but doctor, you... doctor, one of the gains that this, this um, gesture by the president is supposed to help us is to reduce the pressure on Forex, especially where oil and gas is concerned, because one of the things that is putting pressure on Forex, as it were, it's our trade you know, of um, crude in Forex. In, in dollars, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm saying the same thing, and I'm saying for that to happen, that means they would have to go and buy from the foreign exchange market, the Naira. And if they're buying Naira from the foreign exchange market, it simply means that they are actually, um, you know, selling a, another currency. That's what it means. Mm. You have to take another currency, and then before you can buy the Naira. Why can't so the see, central you, bank... Why can't the central bank just directly fund these refiners to be able to get, you know, um, Naira to buy? Why, why, why would we still... Because from, from your analysis this morning, we'll literally just be going around the same circle. Right. That, uh, you know, the, the, the central bank can fund them. But remember that this is somebody that has his own money privately and they want to go and buy uh, their, their crude. And I'm telling you that, look, it, we can go either ways. If you just tell the man, say, look, bring 5 billion naira, I don't care where you get it from, that's fine. They can bring that money, but what I'm going to tell you is it will not have the desired effect in the FX market because that 5 billion can come from the informal sectors where uh, informal transaction areas where they are not typically captured in a you know, financial mm. envelope. So the truth is, yes, um, for us to make it work, we have to make a choice. Are we going to send them to the formal markets to go and buy? That way they even affect 
the, 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 the Naira activity. So many people are, are requesting for the Naira uh, and that balances the request for the dollars and improves our efforts. Mm -hmm. Or are we going to ask them to bring it from anywhere? But I'm warning that if they bring it from anywhere, they can pick it from the informal market and that wouldn't change our fortune. So the policy would have been a failed policy in the first instance. Okay. Now, now, if, if, I mean, there are some merits in the policy, but you know that when you take a policy, you now have to flesh it out. The fleshing out will have to be with how are you going to drive this policy and how do you dot your I's and cross your T's? How do you take care of the what if analysis? If this happens, this is what we're going to do. If this happens, this is what I'm going to do. But I think the policy is just a policy, uh, you know, sort of uh, statement at this material point in time. But these areas of concerns are things that I'm saying that the government needs to look at to see what exactly they want to achieve and how they're going to go about it. And even when you go about it in a certain route, whether it's in the you know, open that they can bring whatever Naira they have or they have to come and buy it from the official market, meaning they have to bring something to trade, whatever that be the case, you need to look at the merits and the demerits across board and see how you can make sure that you cushion whatever effect, uh, negative effect each of the methods will have. Okay, so we're about to wrap up the show, but just as a conversation of hope, let us look at if this policy actually flies and becomes successful, let's look at the end users, the everyday Nigerian, you and I who has to buy the commodity as fuel, as um, you know, diesel and all of that. What will be the gains? How much do you think this will impact on the pump price of the commodity at the end of the day? Okay, yeah, it's going to be a lot more stable because uh, once you're selling Naira, uh, those undulations that we see at the FX market is not really going to uh, play out. Now, let me give you reasons. Um, when you look at the official market, there's a trend. Whether it's going up or it's going down, there's a trend to it. Uh, but um, if you force people to go and buy dollar from the uh, black market, what you tend to see is that the you know it's basically a seller's market, and whatever they tell you is what you pay. So the, the undulations in the market in the uh, in, you know in the parallel market um, is actually worse than that in the official market. So what we are hearing is they're going to buy a naira at the official prevalent rates, and what that simply means is that there is a lot more control because they are benchmarking against the official rate. So we would have a more stable uh, price for our uh, end products. And it would mean that it would equally affect supply because if you cut them the pains of having to source dollars and you know, uh, buy the crude, and all they have to do is exchange whatever money they have at the foreign exchange market and get Naira, uh, if that's the route they want to take. What that also means is that we will have better supply because instead of waiting to source dollar, then go and pay, then the outside bank will have to confirm it abroad before allowing you to pick up the inventory. What that means is that we just have uh, the transaction happen within the Nigerian bank much quicker, and then the supply is much quicker. So the issue of having a scarcity here and there may not actually play out as often as it plays out today. Okay. Great conversation this morning. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wisdom Enang, for coming in and throwing light on that because Nigerians must really know what to expect out of certain policies that are being pushed by the federal government. As it stands, fingers crossed, will um, you know, the federal government actually implement this policy? How soon will the refiners start buying um, crude oil in Naira and selling it back, of course, um, to depots and oil in Naira? Thank you so much, Dr. Rick Stomina, for your time on the show this morning. Thank you. Deeply appreciate it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Well, great there. It's just a thin line of hope once again that Nigerians might have. If this is implemented, just like Dr. Wisdom Enang has said this morning, we will be able to gain a more stable pump price for um, the commodity. And then, of course, it will invariably impact on the quality of lives of Nigerians. Just like what you've asked, and, and we hope that the federal government will be able to implement this so that Nigerians will be able to, I mean, effectively go to the pump price at the retail um, you know, stations and buy fuel at a mm. reasonable amount of money. Mm. It, it will be a welcome to development to Nigerians.
Well, it's important, and just like Dr. Wisdom and I have said, every policy has ifs and ifs not. Yeah. They have to really look into that and make sure that the plug all the ends. But that's the march we are going to talk about today on Rise and Shine. It is day six. Seven. Day seven, I beg your pardon, yeah. of the protest. We are winding down in the first 10 day count. We do hope that Nigerians stay safe out there and take the best decision for themselves as a people. Thank you for being a part of our show this Wednesday morning. My name is Uyai Emen. My name is Ime Emmanuel. Do have an amazing day. Bye-bye for now.